Some people believe we are now facing the erosion of civilization, that we're becoming less. Others see the dawn of a new way of being. Will most of us become parts of a machine in a polluted world run by technocrats? Or will we transcend limitations of the past by leveraging this new world of connections and economies? Will we become masters of technology or servants? Things are changing at a pace that some argue is overwhelming people's ability to adapt and the planet's ability to change. So what do you do? What do you do? How do you alter the path of a world that is moving so fast? You get ahead of the trends. You learn the patterns of the past and the methods of identifying the outcomes of the present. You dig in. You learn how to learn. You learn how to unlearn. And you learn again. You train your mind, the most powerful computer there is, to process information faster and make revealing connections. You learn how to research. You learn how to identify the patterns and pursue the truth. You learn the benefits of failure and the importance of imagination. You learn how to make connections that lie beneath the actions, and you get to new answers and new ideas faster. Can we solve the problems of tomorrow with the assumptions of today? Or do we need to look forward and see where the human mind will be 20 years from now? At CLA, we're finding answers in the wisdom of the past, the data of the now, and in the mastery of the human condition. We have 13 research centers and 20 students working in the Minnesota legislature each session. We have a campus that's smack dab between the leaders at the Capitol and the entrepreneurs in the heart of the business district. Six of our professors have won the Guggenheim Fellowship over the past decade, and over a dozen CLA faculty and alumni have won the Nobel Prize. We're shaping new fields of inquiry where you'll learn how to get ahead of the trends and mechanisms for changing the world. The University of Minnesota is shattering expectations for what liberal arts can be. So join us in creating the change agents of tomorrow. Join us in discovering the science and art of changing everything. Welcome, and thank you for joining us on this lovely fall morning. My name is Meron Ayala, and I am a senior in the College of Liberal Arts studying Global Studies. Um, after seeing that video, I am even more proud of my decision to study here. Um, I am delighted to be here this morning to serve as your MC, speaking on behalf of all CLA students. We are so grateful for all your hard work on behalf um, our, Excuse me. Speaking on behalf of all CLA students, we are so grateful for your hard work on our behalf, and I am thrilled that you are here this morning. Two years ago, Dean John Coleman shared his vision for the College of Liberal Arts during his inaugural Road Ahead address. This morning, we are excited to share with you the progress we've made since then, both envisioning our path forward and implementing initial steps. Two years ago, Dean, sorry. I'll also tell you a little bit about my own CLA journey and how the college is helping me prepare for life after graduation. Later, we'll learn more about how CLA is creating the most desirable graduates through the new Career Readiness Initiative. Judy Anderson and Professor Oscon Kerner will join CLA alumnus and Access Minnesota host Jim Dubois in conversation about this new effort to empower students upon graduation. We'll end the program with a conversation with Dean John Coleman about his vision for the liberal arts and his goal for the college. The Dean will be answering questions you submitted prior to this event. This will be followed by a reception where you can continue the conversation over coffee and pastries. To begin, I'd like to quickly bring you up to speed on our planning efforts this past year. First, the roadmap has set a goal, has set as a goal the relentless pursuit of research and creative excellence. This year, we launched several new initiatives to promote research and creative activities across the college. We added 31, ten, we added 31 tenured and tenure-track faculty in 18 departments across the arts, humanities, and social sciences. These professors will bring a surge of new intellectual energy to our college. Thanks to help from our wonderful supporters, Ken and Janet Talley, we were able to launch the first round of the Talley Faculty Research Awards. Over the next five years, the funds will provide $1.5 million of research support to recently prom promoted associate professors. Eight faculty members are currently conducting innovative research projects that offer insights into both their disciplines and critical challenges facing society. 
Psychology alumnus Brian Engdahl established the Engdahl Family Research Fund in the Department of Psychology with a wonderful new gift. Engdahl Research Awards will fund projects with both behavioral and neuroscientific individuals, neuroscientific elements that have the potential to improve quality of life for both individuals and communities. Grand, Chall Grand Challenges Exploratory Research Grants was awarded to 22 CLA faculty across the arts, humanities, and social sciences. These grants elevate the college's interdisciplinary research strengths for greater impact on the larger societal issues identified by the university. For graduate students, the college increased the base stipend for graduate assistance to $17,500 beginning in the 2016-2017 school year academic year, an increase of approximately 14%. This change allows us to better compete with peer institutions to recruit the best graduate students to CLA. In other news, the Department of Philosophy received the largest gift in its history, $1.25 million from philosophy alumnus Dr. Stephen R. Sutterberg. Dr. Sutterberg said he hopes this gift will contribute to the University of Minnesota's recognition of the fact that philosophical inquiry comprises the bedrock of humanistic understanding. Isn't that amazing? The roadmap's second area focuses on creating a more inclusive and diverse community. Last year, the Joan Aldous Innovation Fund was used to make awards focused on the two key roadmap goals for promoting diversity and public engagement. A total of 25 projects were funded in this year's competition and will promote equity, inclusion, and diversity throughout CLA and within broader communities. Four new colleagues joined us this fall as part of the Race, Indigeneity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Cluster Hiring Initiative. This group of scholars will spark new research, courses, creative work, and community engagement across the College of Liberal Arts and the University. Also, starting this fall, recipients of the University's Diversity and Views Experiences Fellowship, better known as Dove Fellowships, will receive a, will receive a supplementary Beverly and Richard Fink First Year Fellowship and guarantee, Guaranteed Summer Support. Combined, these efforts help boost our acceptance rate among Dove recipients to 73%. The average the preceding years was 54%. We thank alumni Richard and Beverly Fink for their generous support of our roadmap goals of increasing diversity and inclusion in the college and fostering research and creative excellence. A third goal of the roadmap is to deepen a culture of engagement for our alumni, community, and the state. Faculty, staff, departments, and centers took on an impressive range of exciting and important engagement work this past year. For example, we launched Big Questions, a series co-sponsored by CLA and Minnesota Public Radio to bring multiple and diverse perspectives to bear on today's pressing questions. And we expanded our partnership with Minnesota Historical Society to host History Day on campus, um, bringing nearly 5,000 students, teachers, parents, and volunteer judges to campus for library tours, immersion camps, and State History Day. 44 CLE students served as mentors to the middle and high schoolers throughout the year. Finally, I'm excited to share with you our progress on CLE Roadmap School of Readiness. Later in the program, you'll hear firsthand from the faculty and staff working hard to advance the school. For now, I'd like to give my own personal account. Throughout my time here, I've been able to take advantage of so many of the great programs that CLA offers um, to help me and all CLA students prepare for life after college. Um, throughout my time as a student in CLA, I've been able um, so co coming into college, I knew that I wanted my education to be globally oriented and service focused. And I found just what I needed in the Global Studies Department. Thanks to my outstanding major advisor, Danielle Dadris, um, I knew early on that this was the right decision for me. The same year that I declared my global studies major, my sophomore year, I became a CLA ambassador. This group is a community of students and advisors who are passionate about liberal education and giving back to the college. I have loved being able to share my CLA experience with prospective students and helping them see that there is a place for them here. And the more I speak about it, the more I myself realize how valuable my liberal arts education is. In addition to serving as an ambassador, being 
um, a student in CLA has opened up so many doors for me, um, like receiving a Mulholland Cravens Leadership Scholarship, which I was awarded in the spring of my junior year. Receiving this generous internship scholarship made it possible for me to combine into one, my study abroad and summer internship experiences in the beautiful and fascinating city of Cape Town, South Africa. There, I was an intern at a non-governmental organization called Equal Education, a community of lawyers, teachers, parents, community members, and activists who advocate for equality and quality in the South African education system. While it was disappointing to see how much the remnants of apartheid are still prevalent in the country, um, I was so inspired by all the young people leading so many movements and campaigns to create a more equally educated Af South African society. I was able to contribute to those movements by designing a pamphlet for Equal Education's parent branch. I am so proud to say that this pamphlet will be used in the future to educate, um, to educate parents across South Africa on the rights that they and their kids have in the education system. I'm grateful for this experience and the way that it has um, stretched me professionally. Finally, this year, I am a recipient of the Tally Family Scholarship Award. It is such an honor to be part of this incredible cohort of recipients and such a wonderful way for me to end my time in this college. The Tally Scholarship recognizes students who not only achieve high academic honors, but also extend their classroom experiences into the broader university and global communities. Coming full circle, I want to offer my thanks to the person who nominated me for the Tally Scholarship, Andy Gammons. Um, and he is the CLA Recruitment Coordinator and Advisor for the CLA Ambassador Program. Not only do students in CLA have incredible connections to brilliant faculty, who also benefit, but we also benefit from the care and expertise of staff who mentor and guide us along the way. So thank you, Andy, for playing this important role in my academic life. Finally, I'd like to thank the incredibly generous donors who made so many of my experiences possible, specifically Paul Moholam and Valerie Cravens and Ken and Janet Talley. Because of the scholarships I've re received, I'm not only free from financial stress, but I'm also so encouraged by their investment in me, encouraged to keep working towards my goals and to give selflessly to others as they have done for me. To ensure that every student has access to the kind of opportunities I've had, the college is investing in a new program called the Career Readiness Initiative. To tell us more about how CLA is preparing students for the future, we will be joined by Jim Dubois, Judy Anderson, and Professor Oscon Kerner. Jim Dubois is the president and CEO of the Minnesota Broadcasters Association, where he's focused on transitioning traditional broadcasting to digital platforms. His career in radio and, t radio and TV spans nearly four decades. As a reporter, he's covered everything from national political conventions to the conflict in Iraq. A proud Golden Gopher, Jim is the past, Jim is the past chair of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Judy Anderson is the Career Readiness Coordinator for CLE's Undergraduate Education Office. Askan Kerner is faculty director of the CLA Career Readiness Initiative and also serves as the director of undergraduate studies for the Department of Communication Studies. We are thrilled to have our alumni, staff, and faculty in conversation this morning, so please join me in welcoming them to the stage. First of all, thank you, Marone. Very interesting to hear about your story in CLA. Did I lose Marone? <laughs> OK. She's behind me. Well, I'm just joining the conversation about CLA's Career Readiness Initiative. But uh, I understand many of the people in this room have been involved with this project for some time now. And the concept has evolved from bundles to pathways to career readiness. To get us all on the same page, can you tell us what the Career Readiness Initiative is about and why it's important? Sure. Um, yes, indeed, it has, has evolved quite a bit. Um, so the Career Readiness Initiative is really about uh, making a, a recommitting the college to the undergrad education of uh, 
the students. And uh, what we're really doing is we, um, rather than trying to just kind of focus on technical skills or trying to see what is the kind of like uh, job skills that people might need, we're really kind of focusing on what's the value of the liberal arts education. And uh, in this discussion over the last year, we started with, like I said, we started with bundles. We had the discussion with faculty, with staff, a lot of people that are in the room here have, uh, have been involved in these discussions. We really understood that the value of liberal arts is really a set of competencies that we call the core career competencies that are uh, beyond individual careers or beyond individual job descriptions. They're really a set of competencies that enable people to engage productively in the future in really all positions. And we're not trying to train for the first job, we're trying for the third or fifth job, or, the, or career really. And so this, this discussion really shifted away from how can we kind of take a defensive stance in terms of this criticism about what's the value of higher education? How can we be a more, you know, really mount a, uh, an effective defense, an effective argument for the liberal arts? And really saying, let's focus on our strengths. Let's focus on what we do very well. Let's look, look at, what, at the, what the essence of liberal arts education really is. It's those skills like problem solving, it's analytical critical thinking, the ethical decision making, the engaging diversity, uh, active citizenship. All of these kind of competencies that people really need in their lives and really will enable them to have successful, productive lives, whether that be a professional career, whether it be in the communities, whether it be involved in government, right, in the families, that's really what we're all about. And, and so what we really want to articulate in this readiness initiative is that there are real value in the liberal arts. The liberal arts really prepare students very, very well. And what we need to do primarily is to kind of shift the conversation in the college with our students away from what is my major, where's my first job coming from, to say, how does the liberal arts prepare you for life? And so we really want to have that conversation across the board within departments and move away, from, again, move away from this idea that your major determines your future. It's not your major, this is really the things you learn in, as a liberal arts student that really gives you all these competencies. And that's really what we're trying to do. Well, there are obviously a lot of elements to this initiative. How is it changing the day-to-day -day student experience in CLA? Well, I think that's going to be rolled out over the next year as well as the next couple years beyond this. And before I kind of talk a little bit about the different projects that we're working on, I just want to acknowledge that this has really been a cross-functional effort. You know, there's a lot of faces in the audience today who have been really intimately involved, some involved on small parts of the project, but we've had people involved in this from the first year experience staff, Andy from admissions, curriculum, advising, academic advising, the Career Services Center. Um, I mean, the list kind of goes on and on beyond Office of Application and Development. I'm looking at Colin and S S Simone sitting there. There are a lot of different aspects of this project that are kind of in development right now. And so we're, we're pushing many things forward at the same time. It, it takes an effort across the entire uh, CLA services um, staff, and, and they should be given a lot of credit for the work that they've been doing so far this, this fall and summer. Um, what we're rolling out this next year are a couple things. And you can go to our website to, to get more information about um, the projects. The communication staff here has launched that as of Friday. And we will be posting updated information along, as we go along. So one of the first things that we're doing is, for example, putting together a guidebook that will be rolled out to all CLA students in end of January, early February. We are working with the FYE staff to really focus the curriculum in 1002 to be um, more around the core competencies and helping students understand that it's the core competencies, career competencies that they're developing in their four years that uh, will really help them launch into their careers. We will be working with the advising staff, career services staff. They are being trained in the super strong, the strong interest inventory. And then we'll, we will be rolling out to our first year students and other students the ability to use that inventory to focus their career interests and their academic interests and, and start working more intentionally with their academic advisors with that tool. So there's a lot of things going on right now, more to come. I mean, when we count up the projects, we have 12 or 13 things going on, some that will impact students this year, some that will be more long-term. Right. And I would Did say, I miss so, anything? I yeah, I, well, I think the real, the, the, the change is gonna be that we all gonna be talking with students mm -hmm. at, at all points throughout the education about their readiness 
and their competencies that they develop. So at admissions already, by recruitment, we already talk about what you will be learning is these competencies. In the first year experience, we talk about what's the value of liberal arts in terms of these competencies. When they, when they choose their majors, they're going to talk about these competencies. When they're in the classes, the, the, the professors, the lecturers will explain how, how what they teach in those classes relates to these competencies. So we're really changing the conversation. We envelop the student from day one, from actually day zero, <laughs> they minus 100. So they graduate. We involve them in a conversation about how the liberal arts help them achieve their goals. Do you have that little postcard? I have to pull it out. So this is this is our our infographic. Thanks to. Um, the communication staff that helped us in Tessa and, and built these things. This is basically, oh yes, it's, still, it's, the, it's the competencies that envelop the student, the graduate student, right? And you can use it as a kind of a meme, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judy, you had mentioned that developing this initiative was a collaborative effort throughout the college. How can the staff now help move the career readiness initiative forward? <laughs> you know, part of it is I think we all need to be thinking about what kinds of conversations are we having with students. You know, there's, there are specific projects that we're working on and individual people are involved in putting those efforts together and thinking really intentionally about how we're going to roll this out across 13,000 plus students. But I think all of us have relationships with, with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis, whether they're student workers in your office, whether they are, whether you're you know, directing a program, putting on a, a workshop. It's how are we all starting to talk about core career competencies and, in, and kind of embedding that language and having that consistent conversation with any student that we have. Um, that's, the, that's the first thing. I also think that um, as staff and Oscan can add to this, you know, we can all be aware of the different um, opportunities that exist for students. And one of the things that I've been impressed with is the um, number of career-related events that are offered throughout the college, whether it's being offered through alumni relations, the career services, employer relations staff, inf information sessions with companies. We had a fabulous um, CLA internship and career fair last week. If we can help our students, all of us, be aware of the kinds of things that they can engage in um, to, to help them develop their career management skills and have some of these experiences and find opportunities to gain internships, to have, um, you know, whether they're doing service learning or volunteering or research, that we're helping our students engage in these opportunities, no matter what role we have in the college. What would you add to that? I don't know. You? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, this, this is a change. What we're trying to change, we affect the culture of the college in, yeah. in some fundamental ways. We really want to make an argument to take under, uh, undergraduate education extremely serious, to take our responsibility towards our students extremely serious, recognize that these kids come here and invest four years of their life into us, invest their money and their parents' money and the public's money into their education, and that we owe them to, to help them to understand how, how can we benefit them personally, but how that ultimately also benefits us, the state, the community, the world. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a serious undertaking. These, these kids go out and they're going to be the leaders of the world. They're going to make the difference. And we owe them to help them to understand how, is, how does this benefit them, right? I mean, that's one of the things we find. We find often what we hear from employers. They say, yeah, your graduates are, are bright, but they can't necessarily articulate how the liberal arts education has benefited them or how they can contribute to their community, to the organization that they want to join, whether it be a target or be a nonprofit or the, or the government, right? And so what we're really trying to do is, is, is again, in, in, in involve everybody in this discussion. And, and really commit ourselves as staff, as faculty, to our undergraduate students and take that very seriously, take the responsibility very seriously. These, these young folks trust us with their, not with their future entirely, but they trust us to, to prepare them. And that's, a, that's an awesome responsibility. And we really, I think, we'd be committing all our, ourselves together to make that happen. Then we have achieved something really meaningful. Judy and Oscon, thank you so much. Thanks, You're welcome. My name is Michael Goldman, and I teach in Global Studies and Sociology. I'm Katherine Pearson, an Associate Professor of Political Science. My name is Hakim Abdurazak. I teach in the Department of French and Italian. I'm Kat Hayes, and I teach in the Departments of Anthropology and American Indian Studies. My current research looks at this compulsion of countries to build global cities. 
so that places like Shanghai and Dubai are driven to outcompete each other, building lavish and expensive infrastructure that ultimately the people cannot afford. Now this has implications for urban planners worldwide who are trying to figure out how to make city life less, not more difficult for the urban majority. My recently published book, Party Discipline in the U.S. House of Representatives, shows that since 1987, party leaders have considerable power over the careers of their members of Congress, and that they reward loyal partisans with better committee assignments and more legislative opportunities on the House floor. This research is important because it shows that members of Congress have incentives to support their party leaders, sometimes at the expense of their constituents, and often to the detriment of working with members of the other party when they need to come together to solve the nation's most pressing policy problems. I just published a book entitled Eccentric Migrations, Europe and the Maghreb in Mediterranean Cinema, Literature, and Music. My research is crucial in that it looks at less studied human migratory patterns from North Africa and the Middle East, such as the current refugee crisis, which has had unprecedented global impacts. This work has influenced my own artistic expression, an example of which is this painting, which is also on the book's cover. I received a Tali Family Faculty Grant to research states of incarceration here at the military site of Fort Snelling in Minnesota. I hope that this work will provide a comparative perspective and help us to rethink our attitudes towards mass incarceration today. I'm Monica Luciana. I'm a clinical psychologist and developmental neuroscientist. And I'm Bill Iacono. I'm a clinical psychologist, psychophysiologist, and behavior geneticist. I'm Carl Flink, the Nadine Jetty Sween Professor of Dance at the University of Minnesota. I'm also the Artistic Director of Black Label Movement, a Twin Cities-based professional dance company. I'm Anatoly Lieberman, and I teach in the Department of German, Scandinavian, and Dutch. Together, we direct the University of Minnesota site of the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Consortium. Using cutting-edge technology, we will determine how childhood experiences interact with each other and a child's changing biology to affect brain development and psychological adjustment. The results of the ABCD study will provide families, educators, health professionals, and policymakers with useful information to promote the well-being of children. This year I'm an artist in residence at the Bell Museum here on campus. I'll be examining zero-gravity environments, but I'm not going to be going to outer space. We're going to bring those experiments down to the Bell Museum and work with students, dancers, and other researchers to explore those spaces and examine how bodies might move through those worlds in new and interesting ways. Over the years, my main project has been the compilation of a new dictionary of word origins. The folders you see behind me are the fruit of that loom. I also translate a lot of poetry from English and into English. My most recent book has been this. This is a translation of all sonnets by Shakespeare from English into Russian. My name is Julie Schumacher, and I'm the director of the Creative Writing Program in the Department of English. My name is Adriana Zabala. I'm an associate professor of applied voice in the School of Music. I'm Steve Manson. I teach in the Department of Geography, Society, and Environment. My name is Nzile Isoke, and I teach in the Departments of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, and African American and African Studies. I study how black women enact urban resistance in the era of Black Lives Matter, specifically how we use art to transform the political geography of the city. I examine how urban land use and transportation affect water quality in rivers like the Mississippi here behind me. This work is important because it helps us better design urban land use in order to ensure a more sustainable future. I perform with opera companies, orchestras, and in concert halls throughout the U.S. and abroad. My most recent book, Dear Committee Members, won the Thurber Prize for American Humor. I'm the first woman to have been honored with this award. I've always loved the resonance of common humanity that I feel in classical music. And it means the world to me as a singing actor to be a part of these stories and new works that inspire us all and speak to us all, sometimes in ways that are comforting and sometimes in ways that are very challenging. This research is important because it disrupts stereotypical representations of blackness, politics, and community organizing. As the author of seven novels, I'm a passionate believer in the place of arts and humanities at the U, the way they allow us to think across boundaries, to think critically, openly across borders, and even make us feel more alive.
That video we just watched was the perfect introduction to the final part of our, our morning, a conversation with Dean Coleman focusing on the progress of our roadmap and how we're making sure faculty and students can do their best work at CLA. Please join me in welcoming Dean Coleman and Jim Dubois to the stage. What a tremendous video, and we've been honored on more than a few occasions to have some of those great faculty members on Access Minnesota, and every week we do the show and feature a CLA faculty member, I feel like I'm back at the university. It's just amazing and, and great stories. Speaking of stories, we've heard Marone's story, and we've just seen this great video. Are there any particular roadmap highlights from this past year that stand out in your mind, Dean Coleman? Well, I think when I think of the roadmap and what we're trying to accomplish, I think about the environment of the college. That we're trying to create opportunity, we're trying to create a place where people can, as was said just a moment ago, do their best work. And what do people need to do their best work? What kind of uh, opportunities, what kind of resources, uh, what kind of processes do we need to, do we need to improve? And so a lot of the things that you've heard about this morning are in that general vein of how do we improve the environment so that people can, can excel? So when I think about the career readiness work that we've done, hearing about the career readiness uh, initiative, there are, there are other things that we're doing in that, uh, that space as well. For example, we've added substantially to our career advising staff so that uh, the number of contacts, the ability of students to talk to an advisor has really increased astronomically over the past, uh, the past couple of years. They're being invited into classes. Every major works with, with our advisors. And so that's really been transformative, I think, for students, as well as for departments trying to help, uh, help their students. If you think about the area of research, you uh, heard in a number of the previous comments how we've provided more resources for associate professors, how we've tried to provide more resources for graduate students, both to recruit them here, but also frankly, to help them uh, live more easily on the, uh, the, salary that they, uh, the salary that they make. We provided opportunities, as um, we heard earlier, for students to combine internship opportunities along with sort of leadership development and, and alumni mentoring. That was the Mulholland Cravens uh, summer program that, uh, that we heard about. So I'm excited about all of these because I really do think that the question isn't necessarily each particular program but it's really generally, how are we creating an environment that allows all of us to do our best work and to, and to excel? And so I've been really quite gratified with the changes we've seen, the initiatives that we've had over a whole range of areas, all of which have pushed in the same direction of this being a place, and I've said this so many times, I want this to be a place where, whether it's faculty, staff, or students, People are looking at this as one of the absolute best places to build their career and to get their education. And you do that through building environments. And that's both an environment, and that involves resources, but it's also an environment of uh, shared involvement, participation, engagement, of everyone feeling like they're a partner in the efforts, uh, the efforts that we're undertaking. So that's what we're trying to, trying to do. And I think we've gotten off to a very strong start. We're entering now the third year of the roadmap. Do you see it changing or evolving this year and in the years to come? Well, there'll likely be evolution uh, uh, simply in the sense that we are obviously in the midst of a university and the university has its own uh, priorities and goals and, and shifts in direction here and there. And so we'll need to be, to be responsive to those. We were involved in the grand challenge process this year, for example. But we'll see what unfolds at the university level over the next few years and how our work intersects with that. So some of that is to some degree unknowable because we don't yet know what those directions will be at the university, uh, the university level. Uh, within the college, more, more centrally, uh, one of the things we'll be certainly working on, uh, we've already been working on it some, but this will begin to ramp up quite a bit more, are providing more experiential opportunities for our students, internships, we're dedicated to some improvements in study abroad so that students have a more meaningful academic experience in their study abroad. 
uh, study abroad experience. We are looking at uh, continuing to develop more research opportunities for students as well. So I think we'll see all of those kinds of things um, evolve and grow. And we'll also be uh, developing new um, and investing in new ways to bring people together for research projects, to explore particular questions um, uh, collaboratively across multiple, multiple departments and disciplines. So there's a lot of new things uh, on, on the way. I talked about some of these in my State of the College address recently. A lot of this will be helped by our capital campaign, and we're just on the verge of, of uh, really launching into our capital uh, capital campaign that will help support a number of these these initiatives. We have some things we can do internally through reallocating resources, um, but we do need the help of uh, generous supporters and alums and, and donors. And you heard from uh, from uh, Marin, our student speaker earlier, how important these supports were for her. So uh, that will enable us to do a lot of things that would be hard to do on our own, given our own resources that we have right now. Speaking of the capital campaign, what can you tell us about it so far? Well, to, to give a little bit of background, this started uh, quite some time ago, 12 or 18 months ago. And what we did is we began meeting with uh, groups of alums and donors and supporters. We had developed a, essentially a test case, a white paper that we brought to them. And we asked them for their feedback. And in this paper, we had some initiatives and some priorities that we wanted to pursue. And we wanted to see what resonated with people, what they found exciting, what maybe they thought was confusing, what didn't quite explain why does this matter. And that helped us refine our, uh, refine our uh, story, if you will. And so we had uh, a number of these uh, events. There were follow-up interviews uh, with these uh, alums. So we're talking somewhere in the uh, range of 40 to 50 uh, people that we, were, that we were working with. Based on that, we refined our case statement, and this is where we are right now. We're looking at a campaign, of, and I should say this is the, what's referred to as the quiet phase of the campaign, which simply means that we won't be going out to alums and donors right now telling them we're in a campaign that gets launched next, uh, next fall, but we are beginning to do all the groundwork to make this happen. The, um, uh, the campaign has a goal of $150 million. Uh, the last campaign CLA did was over 15, uh, 15 years ago, and that's more than twice as much as we sought in that, uh, in that campaign. Um, not to put pressure on anybody in the room here from our development staff, but I'm quite sure we can do better than $150 million. Uh, $150 million. We're off to a, uh, a good start. And we've, uh, we've looked at this across three primary areas. Uh, we are looking at re asking for funding to uh, develop our student readiness initiatives. You heard about several of those this morning. We are looking for funding in the area of uh, diversity, access, and inclusion. And that would be across uh, faculty, staff, and, and, and students. And we are looking in uh, the area that we're calling research and innovation, and this is support for collaborative research projects, uh, faculty chairs and professorships, graduate student uh, funding, undergraduate research opportunities, and so on. And so these, th these ideas are things that we tested with people. We tested specific ideas as well, not just the, uh, the categories. And I'm excited. I think this is going to be really positive for the college I think it'll allow us to do some things that uh, really literally would have been impossible to do without the, uh, without the campaign in place. Once we kick the campaign off, it runs for uh, until 2021. And uh, at that point, hopefully before, we'll be at that, uh, at that target of $150 million. And we will have this opportunity to invest in these initiatives in all of these, uh, all of these areas, which, as you heard them, tie extremely closely to the CLA roadmap. That obviously makes sense for us to do. It's also important for external audiences to hear that you're actually asking for funds for the things you say are your strategic priorities. And these two, the roadmap and the campaign, really link together extraordinarily tightly. This past summer and fall have been very dramatic and filled with conflict and tensions, both uh, locally and nationally and arguably internationally as well. What do you see as the role of colleges and universities to address some of these challenges? 
You know, I thought about this a lot over the, the summer, and um, this thing about what we, what we do at universities in general, but obviously in our case, in the College of, of Liberal Arts, and what we, what we can offer and what our responsibility is um, in difficult and challenging, uh, challenging times. And as I was thinking about this, I was, I, mean, I was always already, of course, so proud of what we do in CLA and in liberal arts more generally. Uh, but it did make me think even more about how important the work is that we do. As Oscar mentioned, we're sending students off into the world to be the future leaders who will make a difference, whether that's in business or media, government, education, uh, whatever it might be. And so the, the education that they get here, the research that they hear about and that they learn about, matters a lot in the people that they will, that they will become. As I thought about what the liberal arts contribute, I think there's any number of ways to, to approach this. Uh, but to me, the liberal arts are really at the foundation. The knowledge and the skills created by the liberal arts are really at the foundation of prosperous, equitable, democratic societies. I think we, we build the mindset and the skills and the knowledge that encourage those. One of the ways that I've talked about this recently is how the liberal arts help to build compassion, empathy and compassion, imagination, and communities. Just to talk briefly about each of those, because I think these three are essential for functioning democracies, for well-run societies, for societies that can address and talk about talk about problems at the very least, and hopefully solve problems. In the liberal arts, empathy is at the core of almost everything that we study and we do. And what I mean by that is seeing the world through other people's eyes. And you can't have a healthy society or a functioning democracy if people aren't willing to look at the world through the eyes of other people. It doesn't mean they have to agree. But it does mean that you at least have an ability to understand how is it that somebody could be thinking the way that they're thinking? Why do they have the values that they have? Why, are they, why is their answer to this question so different than my answer? And in the liberal arts, in all of our subject areas, we really look at that. We look at, um, if you're looking at how voters behave, if you're looking at consumer behavior, if you're looking at people who have uh, maybe mental health uh, or psychological challenges, if you're looking at the characters in a play or a novel and what's motivating them and how do they interact and why are they acting the way that they have. If you're looking at a, at a work of art and you're trying to understand what the artist had in mind for us when he or she created that work of art. We are constantly in the business of thinking through the eye or, or looking through the eyes of, of others. And I think that in, in all times, and maybe especially in current times, is a tremendously important uh, quality, competency, if you will. Uh, we also build imagination. We help people think about the future. Politi uh, political science, my discipline, helps people think about what future policy options might be and what future governing arrangements might be and what future participatory arrangements might be. But all of our disciplines really uh, look at this, our, our students and our faculty uh, and staff involved in research are looking at how did we get where we are now, what are the factors that are making whatever area we're looking at that are making that area work the way it is right now, what are the important factors, and what are the, which of those might change in the future, what's the potential that they might change, what would it take uh, in order to uh, have some kind of dramatic course shift in that particular area. So that's true whether you're looking at um, issues of uh, psychological well-being, economic well-being, political well-being, uh, the development of uh, culture and, and art and how uh, we infuse that more throughout, uh, throughout our society as well. I've talked about this before in the sense that the liberal arts create an entrepreneurial mindset because we're always teaching our students to Think about how we got here, what are the constraints, what are the opportunities, and what might be around the corner. That to me is building imagination. 
thriving societies thrive on imagination, the imagination of their people, and the ability to put that imagination to good use. And then lastly, I've talked a lot about how the liberal arts help to build communities. And we do this in a number of ways. For one thing, and I talked about this in 2014 in my Road Ahead address, that so many of the questions we look at in the liberal arts are about communities. How do individuals thrive in communities? What prevents them from thriving? How do groups come together? How do groups interact with each other? How does economic development, uh, economic de development work? How do we get social services to people that, uh, that need them? What gives a neighborhood a sense of cohesion and what might break that cohesion apart? What leads people to be fighting and arguing and in conflict with each other? What leads them to find some common ground where they can, where they can get along? So we look at all kinds of questions like this, and we look at them from the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences, not a part of our college that doesn't look at that kind of community building exercise. So I think with these three, and this is just one way of looking at it, through building of empathy, imagination, and communities, we in the liberal arts are playing a tremendously important role in building a society, building democracies that are functional, that are able to meet the needs of people, and that are able to tamp down the conflict. As a political scientist, I always think about conflict. I mean, that's just what we, that's what we study. We study conflict, and we study power, and we study how those work in practice. And conflict isn't always a bad thing. People do disagree. There are different points of view. But it's, the question is, how do we make sure that the conflict is being conducted in a productive way, where you're pushing yourself towards solutions and answers, uh, or at the very least, agreeing to disagree in a peaceable, uh, a peaceable way. And I think it's not just in my discipline, which I know uh, the best, obviously, but it's really across the liberal arts that we contribute in our research and our teaching to this kind of, this kind of thinking about how do, you, how do you have a society that can be a society of healthy debate, prosperity, participation, and engagement. You recently conducted a survey of CLA alumni. What did you learn from that survey? One of the things we found is that our recent, um, our efforts with career readiness will be extremely attractive to our alums. In fact, I suspect many of them will be saying, if only you had been doing this when I was a student, that would have been really good. Uh, there's a lot of interest in how to uh, be ready for the world of, uh, world of work and be able to, to contribute. So uh, we heard a lot there to be uh, encouraged by with our direction in that, that our alums will, will hear that very favorably. They were very positive about the quality of the faculty here. They were very uh, very positive about the range of choices that they have in, uh, in CLA and how the different disciplines fit together, but how they can move between one, uh, one and the other. They were uh, positive about the university more generally. They were very positive about their departments and, and programs, so they had, had a strong connection. It doesn't bother me if someone has a stronger connection to their department than to the college. I don't think that's an unusual an unusual thing. I count that as a win in our checkbox for the, co the college if someone has a strong attachment to their, to their department. And there was a clear sense of that that we saw, a real affection and affinity for their, uh, for their department. So I, I thought all of that was quite positive. We learned a lot about how alums want to hear from us and uh, what kind of events and things might be, might be attractive. So a number of the groups in the college are looking into um, into responding, uh, responding to that. So how do we best reach people? What kind of information do they want? Uh, it seemed like a very good thing to, instead of us trying to guess what it is that people wanted, to actually ask them what is it that they want and in what format do you, uh, do you want it? So I think we got a lot of great information that'll be guiding the efforts of some of our offices over the next year or two. How can staff help the college move closer to its roadmap and larger goals? Well, Listening to Oscon and Judy before, I mean, it really is all staff. I mean, that's, that's how this is happening. Uh, 
The ideas can be put out there, the plans can be put out there, but it's ultimately the, the staff that implements everything. So if we're thinking about the, the roadmap and there's a, the, the car on the road, I can put the car on the road, but it is the, the staff that is driving the engine, building the engine really, that, that, makes, the thing, that makes the thing run. So it's indispensable. The, the staff have gotten us where we are right now in all of the accomplishments that have been mentioned this morning. Those are all staff driven, really. I mean, all of them are being accomplished by staff doing the work that they do. So I would say you're already doing it all. <laughs> so uh, that's something that should be, um, I think you should be really proud of the work that the, the staff has done here, has gotten us to this, uh, to this point. And it, you know, beyond that, I guess I would just say being very mindful of where we can be, where we can be better and bringing those ideas forward so that either people in your unit hear it, I, I hear it, or uh, somehow that your insight into how we can make something better is, is able to contribute. I've talked before about how we're always thinking about excellence, opportunity, and service. How can we, better, how can we be better in all of these? How are we promoting excellence? How are we providing opportunities for faculty, staff, and students? And how are we providing the very best service that we can provide both inside the college but also to the communities that we serve? So when staff have ideas about, you know, I think we could actually do this better in a way that helps us in this goal of being, of promoting excellence or helps us in this goal of providing new opportunities to students, need to, need to share those, need to make sure that people, uh, the people here, I view the staff as complete and full partners in, in, in these efforts. And um, so I want to hear from the partners. And Dean Coleman, we do have several questions that were submitted by staff when they registered for this event. How are we doing in serving our local urban communities and reflecting their needs? We have a, in the, in the roadmap, we commit ourselves to a culture of engagement, a deep culture of engagement with our communities, both locally and, and beyond. Uh, our departments and programs and our administrative offices are doing an amazing amount of work already. I mean, there's a lot going on in, in, uh, in different programs and departments. Just to kind of give a few examples. One I was involved in, so I'll, I'll mention that. Uh, Professor Chigna Desai worked with students at uh, Parkway Middle School in St. Paul. And the idea was that these were students who, um, we want to be sure they stay engaged in school, we want to be sure that they graduate, and we hope that someday we'll see them at CLA and the University of, of Minnesota. Uh, but we know that in, in uh, some populations and among underrepresented students, uh, there are uh, challenges in getting to graduation, which may be due to situations in home life. It might be that the curriculum doesn't speak to them and so on. And so this project was really trying to get students to be able to own their education a bit, to be engaged in their education, to, to identify things that mattered to them, that were important to them, and then build a curriculum around that that was, that was teaching them the relevant knowledge and skills that they needed. So one of the things that they did was uh, have the students each create a digital, uh, it was a digital video project, so to create a video, where they were exploring a particular question that mattered to them. They worked on this with help of our students. They worked on this over the course of the year. They visited campus in, I believe it was in May, 500 st students, it was a beautiful site, 500 students coming into Northrop uh, Auditorium who, most of whom had never set foot on the campus before or set foot on any college campus. And you could just see how excited, uh, how excited they were uh, to be here. And so I had an opportunity to uh, say a few words to them, which was really a great, uh, a great privilege. And then we, um, we got a chance to see the videos that they had created. And these went from the deeply personal some situation that they had dealt with to somewhat more local, uh, maybe global kinds of, kinds of concerns. 
but you could see the degree of passion uh, that the students had um, had devoted uh, had devoted to these. So they were quite extraordinary, really. And uh, that, to me, was a sign of how the work we do outside the university is life changing. We, we're changing the life of our students who come to us, but the work we do outside the university can change lives as well. And that's just one example I could give among dozens, if not 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 hundreds. But uh, it was a very moving. It was very moving for me to see how motivated these students were, and how this one intervention, this one engagement with them, may have altered the life path of any number of those students in that room. Another question, are there any new degree curriculum happenings that we can celebrate? Uh, there are, let me just uh, point to a few of these. Uh, we, uh, and I think this is really exciting, so we are now offering a, a BA MD degree. And this is in partnership with the uh, with the medical school, of, of, of course, and they're very excited about it. And the idea is uh, to this be directed toward uh, getting more underrepresented uh, students and populations into the field of medicine. And so students will be identified who uh, we believe are likely to succeed at this. They will uh, be getting uh, mentoring and uh, contact both from within CLA and in the medical school and they essentially have a guaranteed admission into the, uh, into the medical school when they are finished with the CLA portion uh, of, their, of their degree. So I think that's really, uh, it's quite innovative. I think it's uh, really quite exciting. And it's st starting small. I believe we are starting with 10 students, and we'll see how that, uh, see how that goes. But I think that had, has great, uh, great potential. Uh, another uh, new program that we have is uh, Masters of Human Rights. We did this jointly with the Humphrey School. And this is for students who want to go on and work as practitioners in the fields of human rights, whether it's with an NGO or with a, um, uh, with a, with a government agency or some international, uh, some international organization. So those are two, uh, two examples we have uh, a number of things happening in the area of health in addition to the BAMD, which really responds to student interest in this area as well as the social significance of, uh, of health right now. Um, just to mention one, we have a new BAMA program in health communication. And the Twin Cities are a fantastic market to be engaged in uh, both of those fields, both health and communications. And so these, uh, this brings both of these, uh, both these together. That's in our School of Journalism and mass communication. So those are just three examples. There's a lot of, a lot of others that, uh, that we've added over the past, uh, past few years. What I really like about these are they are addressing areas of important social need, and they are addressing areas of great student interest. Not surprisingly, those two things tend to intersect. Our students are interested in areas that seem to be of great social, social need. So. I think there's a nimbleness here and a, responsi a responsiveness in the college that's really attractive. And a final question from staff. I'm concerned about student awareness, specifically the value our undergraduates are, in, or see rather, in taking classes in the humanities. I would like to know if the college promotes the importance of historical, cultural perspectives, literature, and languages to our students. You know, it's a great, it's, it, it's a great question. and just. Setting aside the fact that we have um, distribution requirements at the university level, and so all students through that will, will encounter these areas, I'm not sure that that's quite enough, and it's not really the, uh, where the question is, is directly going. So in some technical sense, yes, every student has some connection with these, with these areas. Uh, we don't tell our students to shy away from these areas at all. In fact, we want them to engage in these, areas, uh, in these areas deeply. I mentioned before about seeing the world through, uh, through other people's eyes, and the humanities are profoundly important in that, uh, both in the study of, of history, or whether it's thinking through different philosophical traditions, whether it's thinking about literature and what, liter what the author is trying to tell us, as well as what the individual uh, characters in a, in a play or a novel might be, might be trying to tell us. So we certainly are strongly encouraging students in this area. I, I do as well. When I was an undergrad, I had both a humanities and a, 
a social science uh, major, and you know, to me that was the most obvious thing in the world, how those, those fit together. We do wrestle a little bit with student and parent um, maybe worry about what, what, what happens if I study or I, I major in X as opposed to majoring something that seems immediately more applied to the world of work. Ascon and Judy explained extremely well how it's really not about the major. It's about these, these competencies, these, these substantive, the substantive knowledge and the skills that you're developing that will apply broadly to uh, careers. And I'll steal a line from our associate dean for undergraduate education, Gary Olert. We'll know this program is working really well when we see many more students going into the humanities and not being fearful that if I major in history or if I major in a language or if I major in cultural studies or whatever it might be, that I'm, uh, it's going to be hard for me to, to get out into the world of work or hard for me to develop a career. We know it's not true from our alumni records because we can look at what's happened and people go out and they do great. But we understand we're in a moment of time where some students and parents are uh, maybe a little bit concerned, uh, concerned about that. I'll say our departments have been tremendously responsive to that in trying to rethink how they present and describe their curriculum uh, to students. But I do think these, the career readiness will help as well for students to, we'll, we always tell them the intellectual value of studying these areas. Um, but I think they'll also become aware that uh, studying literature, film, media, art, and so on, it does have that intellectual value, but it really actually is building a wide and broad set of competencies, skills, and knowledge that will help you be more, uh, more successful as well. So it actually ties into your future goals uh, that you're seeking when you, when you come to college. Well, Dean Coleman, thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. I'd like to end our formal program with one last video, um, which offers another take on how CLA is shattering expectations for the liberal arts college, for what a liberal arts college can be. So after the video, I hope you'll join me, Dean Coleman, and our other speakers um, just outside the theater for coffee and pastries. And thank you for attending, and have a great rest of your day. Can you do your version? He said, yes. Some say this is it, that we're at the precipice of the precipice. The best of us is behind us, our potential's time is up, and that we've peaked as humanity. How's that sound? that we've regressed from masters of our own destiny to indentured servants to handheld computers. We no longer make the call, we wait for the call. We're no longer allowed to take pride in how we make a living. We simply wait for social media to give us permission. The facts, the truth, the actual story, we're no longer pursuing. We make sense of our world by what we see on our newsfeed. So some say this is it. Others say we're just getting started. Studying the style studies and states of past economies, empires, democracies, aristocracies, monarchies, and whatever else history can give us as lesson, advancing us ahead of the trends, surpassing our former selves, and finding our authentic self, and training our minds, the most powerful computer there is, to process information faster and unveil degrees of connection that before us were unknown. How's that sound? because everything is prologue to right now, measured in happy accidents, failure before victory, and moments of, aha, working collectively out loud, forever students of many styles, we're making perennial leaps and bounds, and we are ready now, because the problems of tomorrow cannot be solved with the assumptions of today, and truth be told, we all do not learn the same, so we expand the picture beyond the frame, and take a closer look at economies, environments, politics, and climates, navigating with light in the dark. Never a stranger to the puzzle, but always akin to our contributing part in the school, house, and college of liberal arts. You got it? Awesome. Thank you. Peace out. There we go.